So when I first started out, I thought all I needed to learn to be a program was just a little bit of HTML, CSS, and some JavaScript. But of course, that's just not the case. You need to know a lot more than that. Because in the early days, every time that I would watch a real developer work, I saw them do things that I couldn't even understand. They were debugging in the browser, running all these mysterious terminal commands, testing out APIs, deployment, the whole lot. Things that I wish I knew earlier that would have gotten me job ready a lot faster. So in this video, I wanna break down some of these overlooked tools and overlooked procedures that you do really need to know as a developer before you are job ready. And make sure you stick around because the last one is probably one of the most important. So let's be honest, when you first open up your terminal, it probably scared the crap out of you, right? You look like you're hacking into the matrix or into NASA. <laughs> I know that's how I felt anyway when I first started working on it. But once you start to really use it, what you realize is that it's a lot faster than like clicking around, using your mouse. And as a developer, the terminal actually becomes this really powerful tool. It becomes almost your best friend. And I mean, it's kind of cool using it once you start to get it. So let's talk about the terminal for a little bit because as a developer, this is something that you really should know how to navigate around. When you open up your terminal, you're interacting with something called a shell, right? And yes, <laughs> It's kind of similar to a seashell, like protecting the sort of soft inner parts of that sea creature. But in computing, the shell is sort of surrounding the core of the operating system. So also known as the kernel. All these things are related, man. Two of the most common shells, which you've probably come across already, is Bash, Born Again Shell. That's what that stands for, which is like the classic shell. And then there's Z Shell, which is Z-S-H, which you've probably seen, which is more modern. It has things like auto completion and it has plugins as well that you can use. And on Mac, you'll actually find that Z Shell is the default. But if you're working with Linux, you're most probably going to be using Bash. Kind of like how I'm bashing you with a little bit of knowledge right now. <laughs> now, you're probably aware of some of the well-known commands in the terminal, like these. And I'm not going to go through all of them because, you know, some of them are pretty basic, like your CD, you know, into folders or out of folders, like your make directory, uh, your create file with touch. So make sure you do get familiar with those. But also, did you know that you can create your own shortcuts, your own scripts within the terminal? So let's say that you're typing in git status all the time. You're always trying to check the git status. And you might be getting sick of it, right? You're like, git status, git status, I'm getting sick of this. <laughs> to know. I don't know, maybe you are. It's a little bit of typing that you have to do, okay? Don't kill me. Well, did you know that you can create a custom git status script by creating a file in your home directory using a .bash rc file or a .z shell rc file and turn that git status into whatever you want, right? And for this particular example, I've got that you can turn it into just two letters, gs, using the alias command like this. And so now git status is gs on your computer. If you want git status on your terminal, you just type in gs. Yes, and you can really do this with any command. So that's a pretty handy tool. And it, that can just be native to you. You can still work with other code bases, but these commands will be your commands. And then you have something else called chaining and grep or grep, which stands for global regular expression print. And by using this stuff, you can do things like, for example, finding all lines with the meta tag in it by typing in into your terminal grep meta index.html. And so now your terminal will send you back all of the tags with meta in it and all of the information that has meta in it. So that's pretty cool. And so for example, chaining using the that and symbol, you can combine two commands in just one Line. So for example, installing the package and then starting the app with npm install and then, you know, and and npm run dev. And so that does two commands in one line. So anyway, the point is get used to using the terminal, learn the terminal. You don't need to be this Linux expert, just don't hide away from the command line. And that takes me to the second part around API clients and getting to know what API clients are and using API clients. Believe it or not, you don't have to test your APIs through your front end all the time. In actual fact, you probably shouldn't be doing that, right? Basically what I'm saying is you don't have to check if the API works after you've created all the design elements you know on your website you can and you really should test your apis before you set up your front end and to do this you need api clients which are tools built specifically for testing if your api works you know before the front end is even connected or even built and once you start using api clients as well you really start to understand what an api is actually doing so popular api clients postman postman is one of the most popular api client it helps you test and inspect your apis by making actual http requests so you can see exactly what your api is sending and receiving and so look if you're confused about http 
Make sure you check the link on the description of this video, which might be right here. I created an entire video on it. And so getting back to Postman, you really should get used to using this tool and it's free to download and use as well. Now I'm not sponsored by Postman. There are many other alternatives as well. So there's Insomnia, there's Thunder Client, there's Hopscotch. But in general, what you'll find is that Postman is kind of the industry standard when it comes to testing APIs. And that takes me to the third thing that you really should get comfortable using. And that is your package.json file, basically your app's blueprint. So if your app was a spaceship, package.json is the control panel. Here's what your package.json tells you, right? It tells you the name and version of your app, which libraries or dependencies your project needs. It also shows you which scripts you can run, like start, build, or test. And it also shows you the metadata, like the authors, like licenses or engines. And so let's look at a simplified version, right? This app is called My Cool App because like I'm a really cool guy. Now it has a few scripts, start, dev, and build, and it depends on Express, Express.js to run and Nodemon to help during development. So now let's break that down. So dependencies are packages your app needs to run in production. And dev dependencies are only needed during development, like test runners or linters and scripts. Scripts are like your custom command center. And so most junior devs, I knew I did, sort of ignore this, but the scripts section in package.json is incredibly powerful and you should start to understand this. It lets you create custom commands that run whatever you want. So for example, you might add scripts like this, lint, test and format, and you can run npm run lint, like npm run test or npm run format. And if you are using yarn, it's even shorter, just yarn lint. You can also chain scripts together as well, like we discussed previously in the command line, or use a library like concurrently to run multiple scripts at once. I do this a lot, like a server, so you can run your backend and your front end together, like when you're in dev mode. This turns a messy setup really into one clean command. And here's another superpower that most junior devs overlook, and that is MPX. So this command lets you run a package without installing it globally, right? So for example, MPX create React app my React or MPX ES lint, which is perfect for tools you only use occasionally. It keeps your global space clean and it avoids version conflicts. When you learn to use your package manager, you stop wondering, you know, what did I install? And you start building smarter, cleaner environments to write code in. And that takes me to the dev environments, you know, your local, your cloud, your containers. And so if you've been building projects while learning to code, it's most likely that you've been building these projects on your local machine. So you've installed VS Code, right? You spin up a React app, you run RPM start, and you're sort of off to the races, right? But unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't work like that in the real world. In a professional environment, your app doesn't just need to work well on your computer, right? It needs to run really well on other computers, other machines, on servers, or sometimes in isolated environments that really aren't anything like your laptop or your home computer. So this is what understanding what a real dev environment like actually is and how to build apps that don't just run locally, right, on your computer, but can be properly deployed everywhere. And now because of this, there is a huge shift happening in the developer world, right? And so more and more teams are now ditching the everyone installs everything locally sort of mantra and they're moving everything to cloud-based dev environments and that's because teams around the world can work on the same project and it looks exactly the same on everybody's machine. Working on cloud-based environments also requires zero setup beyond the browser. You can now do everything in the browser. This means you don't have to install anything on your computer. You don't have to install Node.js. You don't have to even have Git installed. You don't even need to use VS Code, not even a terminal app. You can use everything within the browser. And like I said, because of this cloud-based dev environments, they let you code from literally anywhere and the project looks exactly the same across all devices, across all computers. So for example, thanks to tools like GitHub Code Spaces, you can open up a re repo in GitHub. You can spin up a full Linux container with Node, Python, or whatever stack that you know is needed. You can code inside a browser-based you know, VS Code UI. You can run a dev server and preview your app completely live and use a built-in terminal just like on your local computer. And you do all of this in your browser. And obviously GitHub Codespaces is not the only company that's doing this. You have StackBlitz, Replit is also doing it as well. And basically you get no nightmare installed. You can work from pretty much any device. You just open a URL and you can code away like you are at home on your local machine. And these tools are getting better and faster by the day. And they're also becoming more standardized across the industry. So if you know how to use one of these, you are already miles ahead of other junior developers. And if you don't, then my advice is get some experience 
grab one of your projects and put it into one of these programs. Use code spaces by GitHub and try it out. This will really set you apart from other junior devs. And so the final thing that you should be getting comfortable with and tools that you should be really using and, and get, getting to know as a junior developer is around deployment and hosting, deployment and hosting tools. And basically getting your work online the right way. And so let's start real simple, right? What is deployment? So deployment at a fundamental level really is the process of taking your code and putting it somewhere people can access on the internet. And so when you deploy your code, you're basically doing three things. You are saying, here's my code. You're also saying, here's how to run it. And you're also saying, here's where people can find it through your specific URL that you've uh, attached it to. And so hosting tools will handle the how to run it and the where people can find a part. So your job really is to write the code and these tools will make it public. And so if you're currently building sites with HTML, CSS and JavaScript, or you're using front end frameworks like Vue, like React or Svelte, and then, then some of these tools will be your best friend for deployment for your front end. So you've got Vercel, which is actually created by the team behind Next.js. Then you've got a favorite of mine is Netlify. It's a really great UI to use. I've got a lot of my websites on Netlify. And then you've got GitHub pages as well. And all of these, by the way, are completely free. They're completely free to use to deploy the front end of your website on. So I encourage you to check these out if you haven't already. And so the way that all this works is we'll go through step by step, right? So the first step is you push your code to GitHub. And then from there, Vercel or Netlify, which you have to link to your GitHub, will watch for the repo that you've linked and watch for any changes that you've uh, that you've created on your repo. And then it runs a build, which is basically, it just optimizes the code that you have put on the repo. And then it uploads that build file to their global CDN. And so what is a CDN? A CDN is a content delivery network. And what Netlify or Vercel will do is they have a network of servers all around the world. And so they will make copies of your files, copies of your code. And so when someone visits your site, these files are loaded from a server that is local to them, which makes loading your website a lot faster. And so after it uploads those files to, to the global CDN, you get a live shareable link, something like, you know, your project.vercel.app, and that's it. There's no FTP, there's no firewalls, there's nothing like that. You get a nice little URL that you can share. But then if you want to take it a step further, which you really should do, you should attach that website to a custom domain that you can buy, which is very easy. And you can connect all of this through, you know, Netlify or Vercel. You can set up an S SSL, which encrypts the data that's being transferred over the internet, which gives it that nice HTTPS. And right now you do get that for free on Netlify. I'm not too sure about Vercel, but a lot of the providers will offer that for free. So that's pretty cool. You can do some more advanced things, which is to configure some of the meta tags, some of the meta information so that you get a better SEO. But then it comes to deploying full stack apps, right? Where you've got the front end, you've got the back end, where you've got your database, you know, you have to sort of connect all of these things together. That's when you might need other services, right? And for backend services, something that I've been using is Render, which you know is really, really good. I'm not sponsored by Render or anything like that. There's other ones that you can use. Railway is another one. And there's Fly.io. It really doesn't matter which one you use. Once you use one, you kind of understand how they all work. But if you are creating a backend with Node, Express, MongoDB, you will need a backend server with runtime because you can't just have your backend running on static hosting. So that's why you have some of these other services like your Renders, like your Railway, that are specific for backend service that you should get comfortable creating on, you know, building on. Then you've got other areas that you should get comfortable with like Docker, which has, you know, containers and then CI, CD, which is continuous integration, continuous deployment. And Docker containers basically help you to containerize different parts of your application so that your app runs the same everywhere. I'm not gonna get into the specifics of Docker right now because it's gonna blow this video out, but you know, it's something that you should get comfortable with as well. And these things are not too difficult to understand. And so CI, CD pipelines, this stuff can get a little bit technical. Uh, so for example, you will push your code to GitHub, GitHub Actions runs your tests, um, Docker will build your app, and then render deploys the entire container. That's kind of how this whole sequence would work. It's not really beginner friendly stuff, but once you're sort of over the HTML, CSS, JavaScript sort of builds and you start making some React apps, you wanna start building things with Node.js, but then learning the basics, learning the basics of containers, learning the basics of CI, CD, this stuff will put you miles ahead of other junior developers. So that's pretty much it guys. These are the tools that uh, I've been spending a lot of time learning. I recommend you learn them as well. It's gonna help a lot with kind of understanding the whole architecture of projects and the system design and everything. So I'd recommend getting comfortable with these. That's it. I'll see you guys in the next one.